It's good to be with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, open them up to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. In the 1939 movie, The Wizard of Oz, the main character, Dorothy, says the famous words, there's no place like home. There's no place like home. I think that most of us would tend to agree. Now, now sure, taking trips and traveling and going on vacation, that, that's fun, but there's just something about coming home and, and sleeping in your own bed that we love. So, to be forced away from your home, especially for an indefinite period of time, that is a dreadful thought. In fact, the word that we use to describe this immediately evokes fear. Exile. We associate exile with words like banished, hopeless, foreign, depressed, lonely. Exile describes a period of time at the end of the Old Testament where the people of God were taken into captivity and they were moved away from home and they were moved into a foreign place. And they began to learn to live in a culture that didn't believe the same way that they did. They learned to live in a culture where they didn't have influence. But what's amazing is that in the midst of the fear and despair of the exile, there's a few heroes of the faith that emerge. There's a great new articulation of their faith, and there's a new trust in God that develops as the people learn to live in a culture that doesn't believe the way that they do. And one of these young men is Daniel. With your Bibles open to Daniel chapter 1, would you please stand for the reading of God's Word? Now, as we walk through the story of Daniel this morning, I want you to keep in mind Romans chapter 12, verse 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Don't conform, but be transformed. Remember that as we study this this morning. Daniel 1, beginning in verse 3. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. May the Lord bless the reading of His Word this morning. You may be seated. Almost seven years ago now, my wife and I moved to Texas. We love living in Texas. We enjoy living here. One of the things I've noticed in that time is that Texans have a way of assimilating you into their culture. There are certain things that people in Texas say, there are certain things that people in Texas do that, that just aren't like the rest of the world. For example, the vocabulary is just something else. Um, in Texas, I learned that you can call a shopping cart or a grocery cart a buggy. That, that, that was news to me. In Texas, when, when you tell somebody that you're about ready to do something, you can say, I'm, I'm fixing to, to go to lunch. In fact, I noticed in our communion prayer this morning that they said we're fixing to take communion. And I said, that's, that's Texan. I'm um, in Texan, when you refer to, to more than one person, you say y'all, you all, y'all. And my wife, she is much more Texan than me because it was like, you know, we had been here for two weeks and she's using y'all all the time. <laughs> what, what else? The, the, the weather in Texas is different. Now, th there's four seasons in Texas. They're just different than what a lot of people are used to. There's almost summer, summer, still summer, and winter. <laughs> I know it's been a little unseasonably cold this, this winter, so it seems like it's drug out a little longer. 
But, but only in Texas will you hear somebody say when it's 100 degrees that it's a bit warm outside. <laughs> really? <laughs> Feels like an oven. Or in, in, in Texas, we, we occasionally get snow or ice, um, like, like we have this year. Um, but it's always entertaining to me when there's forecasts for snow or ice because, I mean, things just get shut down everywhere. I mean, schools shut down, people act like the apocalypse is coming. Um, <laughs> A, a friend of mine showed me this website about a month ago. It was poking fun at our neighbors down in Austin and how they react to the, to the cold weather, and I thought that uh, some of us could relate. So, uh, this is called 2014 Snowpocalypse, and there are some uh, captions that go along with the pictures. Many woke up to find their yards destroyed, covered in sheets of ice and snow, <laughs> and their belongings decimated. Unable to find direction in the whiteout, many Austinites were trapped in snow-filled forests. <laughs> With our winter harvest frozen, how will we find food? <laughs> Scared and alone, animals were left to fend for themselves. <laughs> will we survive and make it to the 70-degree temperatures this weekend? Please send prayers. <laughs> oh, it's funny, but there's a little bit of truth there, isn't it? Uh, also, in Texas, chivalry is not dead. In Texas, you'll find guys opening up doors for girls. It's not uncommon for you to hear, yes, ma'am, and yes, sir. Now, now, perhaps bigger than anything else, Texans are a proud bunch. You know the slogans, everything's bigger in Texas. Don't mess with Texas. Proud to be a Texan. And the one I can relate to, I wasn't born here, but I got here as soon as I could. Now, <laughs> As, as humorous as this is, there are moments when we get in positions where we just assimilate into cultures without really knowing it, where we're not really aware of what's going on, where we start shopping with buggies and we start calling people y'all, and, and things like this can happen. And in the story of Daniel, we get this amazing snapshot of this kid who's facing this enormous pressure to become something he's not. He's facing this enormous pressure to be something that he's not supposed to be. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3 says, Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility. Now, what's going on is the Babylonians have come in and they have invaded Israel. They've come into Jerusalem and they've ransacked the temple, they've defiled a lot of holy things. Now, a lot of this is about money and wealth, and so they're taking these artifacts and they're taking them back to Babylon, but they also take some people with them too. They start taking these young men of nobility. Verse 4, youth without blemish, of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. Now realize, Daniel is somewhere between 15 and 18 years old. He was taken from his home, he was taken from his family, he was taken from his friends, he was taken away from his teachers. He was probably studying the Torah and the Old Testament Scriptures at this time. And he is taken to a place that is completely foreign, a place that was far from home, a place that was away from his family and friends. And in the midst of all this, at a very young age, he had to face this enormous pressure from above. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was 16, the things that I were thinking about were, I want to make sure that I keep my girlfriend and I want a car. Okay, like that's what I'm thinking about at 16 years old. And Daniel, he's this young man who's facing enormous pressure, and he's got the weight of an entire nation riding on how he acts and how he behaves. You see, Babylon was the superpower of the world at the time. It was one of the great wonders of the world. The city had 60 miles of walls that were 300 feet high, 80 feet thick, and they went down into the ground 35 feet so that no one could dig a tunnel underneath them. There were 250 towers. Their gates were made of brass and gold. I mean, the wealth of the city was incredible. It was a very religious city. There were over 53 temples and 180 altars to their gods. And it was the goal of King Nebuchadnezzar to bring these young men in and to assimilate them into their culture. And then 
those young men to advise him on how to assimilate the rest of the population into the culture. And so the first thing I want us to notice today is Daniel's resistance. Daniel's resistance, beginning in verse 5. It says, The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. If you like to underline or highlight in your Bible, verse 8 is worthy of being highlighted. Because this is where the story gets really interesting. And when it turns from a story of captivity and a story of nations and a story of political issues to something bigger, even something bigger than a little integrity issue, this is when the story becomes about how God works when His people are faithful. See, Daniel was fine with the name change. He was cool with the new clothes. He was fine with the new place he was living. I mean, he was cool with all of that. But there came a point in his life where he said, I'm drawing a line in the sand and I'm not going to do this. And for Daniel, it became eating food from the king's table. It sounds like such a little thing. It's just dinner. It's just a meal. But the issue for Daniel is that this food was ceremonially unclean. It wasn't kosher. The blood hadn't been drained from the animals the way that it was supposed to. You can read about the Israelites' dietary restrictions in Leviticus chapter 11 and Deuteronomy 14. See, Daniel had learned this all of his life. As a young boy studying the Torah and studying the Scriptures, he would have had this memorized by heart. Daniel knew that this wasn't the right thing for him to do. Now, the other problem was that the food at the king's table was first offered to his gods. So the food was offered to his gods, it was sacrificed before them, and then it was eaten by the people at the table. And Daniel said, no, no, I, I can't do that. And his boldness at such a young age is amazing because it would have been so easy for him to say, it's just food. <laughs> it's not a big deal. This isn't some big thing that they're asking me to do, it's just dinner. And Daniel not only possesses this integrity, but also a huge trust in who God is. I can't help but to think in that moment when Daniel is faced with the issue from eating the king's table that he's not thinking back to when his people left, when this people left Egypt all those years earlier. When Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and he led them into the wilderness and the first thing that they run into when they're in the wilderness is that there's no food. And in Exodus chapter 16, we're told that the people began grumbling and complaining and they began saying, even when we sat at the table of the slave drivers, at least we had food. Even when we sat at the table of the Egyptian empire, we had what we needed. We had the nourishment that we needed. We had the food that we needed. And so what's God do? He sends the manna from heaven. He says, if you live in a way that's set apart, if you live in a way that I've called you to live, then I will provide for you. I'm going to provide nourishment for you. I'm going to provide strength for you. God says, you can live in a way where you don't conform, but you're continuing to be transformed. I will provide for you. Old Testament scholar Walter Brueggemann says, the invitation to Daniel and the rest of the exiles is to cease taking food and nourishment and life and hope from the empire. And what's being offered to Daniel is different than a diet. This isn't just some simple moral dilemma. It's a deep conviction that God offers us a new bread, that there's a new way to live that doesn't revolve around the empire, and it doesn't revolve around the promises of the empire and the promises of the world. When I was 15 years old, like most of you, I'm guessing, I took driver's ed. 
I went to a small school where we took driver's ed at our school, and in my entire class, we just took it together. And my friends and I, we thought that we were the coolest kids on the face of the planet when we were taking driver's ed because that meant we were just one step closer to getting our driver's license, one step closer to getting a car. And so we go in there thinking that we're on top of the world, and then they show us these instructional videos. And when I was taking driver's ed, they showed us these, these low-budget movies that were made from the 1980s. And then they were just warning us of the dangers of distracted driving. They warned us of the dangers of driving too fast, the, the, the dangers of, of driving without a seatbelt. And I tell you what, those videos scared me to death. I mean, I was terrified because they, they showed you what could happen to you if you drove this way. And so when I got my license, I mean, I had both hands right here, 10 and 2. And when I, when I drove, I didn't listen to the radio. I never went above the speed limit. I mean, I, I, just, I just focused because I didn't want to end up like those videos. But then sometime along the way, every now and then I'd go a little over the speed limit and, and nothing happened. And, and I started listening to the radio in my car and, and I didn't get in an accident. And I called my parents for my big new bulky cell phone and, and it was okay. And the question is, how, how can one moment we be completely convinced that something is dangerous and deadly and unwise, and in the next moment our actions don't line up with our convictions? Because there are some of you in this room this morning who you would have never believed that, that you'd be behaving the way you are right now two or three years ago. You would have never believed that, that you'd be living the way you are right now. You would have never imagined that you'd be doing the things that you're doing right now. And I say that because I've seen it happen before. It happens all the time. I've seen this play out at youth camp. I've seen it play out in summer retreats. Where a kid raises his hand and he stands before the whole group and talks about how he's had this incredible experience. And he says, I'm not going to sin anymore. I'm done. I'm going to change. I'm not going to go back and do those things anymore. And I tell you this, that kid's going to go back and he's going to face the same temptations he faced before he went to camp. And unless he decides in his heart, unless he starts living with a deep conviction, I'll tell you this, there's probably not much that's going to change. Because as believers, we are really good at having preferences and we're really bad at being people of conviction. We have lots of preferences on how we'd like to live or how we imagine we could live. But very few convictions where we say, whatever happens, I'm drawing a line in the sand right here and I'm not going to do this. I'm not crossing this line no matter what. Daniel was a man of conviction. Verse 8 says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. So how many of you, if you really thought about it, you know right now that you're living with lots of preferences and lots of gray areas, but probably not enough conviction. And how many of you would say, if it came down to it, you know that there are areas in your life where you'd compromise, and probably some pretty important areas? Because let's be real here. Daniel's choosing vegetables and water over a nice meal. I mean, there's something good that's being offered to Daniel. I mean, they're bringing out the lamb, and they're bringing out the steak, and all the spices, and they're drinking Dr. Pepper, and Daniel's like, no, you I'm, I'm good with my carrots and water. See, friends, there are moments when what the world's table is offering us is really appealing, where it looks really good. A Del Frisco steak is better than a bunch of carrots. Let's just be real. So I want you to think, what, what, what's the one thing that's sitting on the world's table for you that you know that you're apt to compromise. You know that's an area where, where you're tempted to give in. It, it, it's the area, it's the place that you know that if you're put in that situation, that, that you'll probably make the wrong choice. Well, what's that one area? And maybe it's sexual sin. Maybe it's watching things that you know you shouldn't be looking at. Maybe it's a temptation to lie, a temptation to cheat just a little in order to get ahead. Maybe it's gossip and talking bad about other people, temptation to lie, a relationship that's gone bad. Maybe it's some off-color humor every now and then. 
And it shouldn't be hard for us to figure out that one thing. And if you're saying to yourself, man, I just don't know, you're probably lying. Because the truth of the matter is, the world has laid out a really nice buffet for us. And it's very tempting to, to assimilate into what they're doing. It's very tempting to just give up a little moral ground so that we can gain something. It happens all the time. But here's the problem. The bakers of this world and the food of the empire and the king's table is filled with enticing things, but they make promises they can't deliver. And the promises made to Daniel were, Daniel, if you don't eat this food, you'll never get ahead. Daniel, if you don't eat this food, the king's going to be mad at you. If you don't eat this food, you're never going to make it in the world. You're never going to have any influence. You're never going to be able to do the things that you want to do. You're just going to be another guy, another slave. You'll never get ahead. And some of you who work in the secular world, you know what it feels like. You know what it feels like to think, you know, if I don't participate in the inappropriate jokes at work, I may not fit in. If I don't boast about myself and make myself seem great in front of others, then I may never get ahead and I may miss out on my opportunity. If I don't fudge the numbers just a little bit, then, then I may not get that promotion. And that was the promise that Daniel kept hearing. Again, Walter Brueggemann says, we have become victims of the junk food on the table of the empire, of social ideology, the attractiveness of consumerism, the killing seduction of security and despair. We've been silenced by our hunger for the world. And so my question for us is, who would we become if we lived solely off the hopes of our dominant culture? Who would we become if we lived off the hopes and beliefs of America? We'd become like the world around us. There'd be a growing isolation. We would long for authentic community, but we would settle for false community. There'd be despair and anxiety. There'd be indifference and pride, and selfishness. There'd be loss of hope. So we see Daniel's resistance. Secondly, notice Daniel's dependence. His dependence, verse 9. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king, who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you are in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Proverbs chapter 16 verse 7 says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. You see, Daniel knew how to conduct himself. I love Daniel's spirit as he goes into the people in leadership over him. Because he doesn't walk in, he doesn't kick down the door and say, I'm not doing this. This isn't right. I'm not going to live this way. He doesn't lay down the law. He doesn't get angry. He doesn't get upset. He just walks in with great humility and with a creative solution. And he says, just give me 10 days. Just give me 10 days and see if God doesn't work in those 10 days. I mean, we're talking about a man with complete dependence on God. Now, I love it when Christians stand up for the truth. And in my opinion, we don't stand up for the truth enough. But I am deeply concerned about how we stand for the truth. Because there is often a spirit of pride and a spirit of arrogance that's displayed in the way we stand up for the truth where we look a lot more like Westboro Baptist Church than we do like Jesus. John Ortberg says that there is a fine theological distinction between being a prophet and being a jerk. I think he's right. And Daniel walks in, and he's not offensive. He's not judgmental. He's not threatening. He doesn't organize a protest. He doesn't call a lawyer. He doesn't talk about how all his rights are being violated. He just walks in with great humility and great authenticity, and great respect, and says, just give me 10 days. Just give me 10 days and see what God does. 
So we see Daniel's resistance. We see his dependence. Notice thirdly, his confidence. Daniel's confidence, verse 15. It says, at the end of 10 days, it was seen that they were in better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So I like here that Daniel kind of becomes the kid who asks for more homework in school. Like, like do you notice that? That, that, that everyone now has to eat vegetables and water? Uh, I think that's hilarious. But, but then in, in verse 17, just notice this simple phrase, God gave. As for these four youths, God gave. And friends, here's the principle that we need to understand. God is not searching for someone who is influential that He can make faithful. He is looking for someone who is faithful that He can make influential. Let me say that again. God is not searching for someone who is influential that He can make faithful. He is looking for someone who is faithful that He can make influential. In Matthew chapter 25, verse 21, Jesus, in telling the parable of the talents, says, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a little. I will set you over much. Enter into the joy of your master. And my temptation is for me to believe that God is looking for the sharpest, that God's looking for the brightest. He's looking for the best looking that he's looking for the celebrities, he's looking for the athletes, and he's gathering all of them together because he's going to do something great through them because they have influence. But when we look at Daniel, God doesn't give anything to Daniel when he receives this position. He doesn't give him anything when he knows that he's going to be in the presence of the king. He doesn't give him anything when he knows this opportunity is coming. He doesn't give him anything because of his talents or because of his good looks or because of his wisdom. But the moment Daniel is faithful, God gives him influence. And he took a man of faithfulness and consistency, and he raised him up to be a man of influence. And I see young people in the church all the time who want to skip the first step, who want to do great things for God, whose hearts are burning to do something great in the kingdom of God, who want to make a lasting impact. But friends, you have to be faithful first. And that's what we take from the story, is that God gives when Daniel is faithful. And we need to understand, there is a temptation for each of us to eat from the king's table. And there's a nice feast that's laid out before us every single day. And if we don't become people of great conviction and people who say, I'm drawing a line in the sand and I'm not going to cross that line, no matter what, I'm not going to cross that line. If we don't become people of great conviction, then what we eat from the king's table could short-circuit all the plans that God has for us. Those plans could be taken away just like that. There were two Swiss men who set out on January 12, 1997 to become the first people to circle the earth in a high-tech, solar-powered, pressurized hot air balloon. This was a $2 million project. The balloon itself cost $1.5 million. And these two men had devoted much of their life to this project. They had invested their life savings into this project. Well, not too long after the balloon lifted off, fumes began to invade the cabin of the balloon. A fire broke out and the entire craft went down into the Mediterranean Sea. The problem was a failed fuel clamp that cost $1.16. A $1 piece of metal brought down a $2 million project. Like that. And we can look at ourselves and say, man, it's just food. It's just dinner. It's just a small lie. It's no big deal. Nobody saw what was going on. I was far away from home. And it can be gone. So as we close, I just want to ask a few questions. Number one, what's the world set in front of you that's tempting you every day? 
What, if it, what is it that, that's right in front of you that, that could short-circuit the plans that God has for you? Number two, where is it that you're living out of a preference and not living out of a conviction? And number three, could you trust God enough to eat from the new bread? Could you trust God enough to, to say, God, I don't know if I'm going to get that promotion, but I'm going to trust you? Could you trust God enough to say, God, I don't know what I'm going to do if that relationship ends, but I trust you? Could you trust God enough to say, God, God, I'm scared and I'm lonely, but I trust you? Could you trust God enough to say, God, I don't know how I'm going to be financially stable if I give the way that you're calling me to give, but I trust you? I trust you to provide for my needs. And just like the Israelites leaving Egypt all those years ago, I know that you're going to give me nourishment and the food and the ability as I need. And just like Daniel, I know that you're going to give me what I need in order to make an impact in this world to be an influencer. And when I think of faithfulness, I think of Bob and Dottie Hughes. I think about Bob and Dottie and how they're two of the founding members of this church and how they have been faithfully and consistently serving this body for 44 years. They've never wanted acclaim. They've never wanted awards. They've never wanted to be in the spotlight. But day in, day out, week in, week out, they've just been consistently faithful, godly servants, and they have influenced the lives of hundreds and hundreds of people. There are hundreds of people in this room right now whose lives have been affected and influenced by Baba Dottie Hughes, even if you realize it or not. And I really believe that when we are faithful, he gives us influence. That when we are faithful in the little things, that he'll put us in charge of big things. And so as we go into a time of prayer, I just want us to, to go before God and say, God, this is what's on the table for me, and I'm giving it to you. And God, I, I want to move from a person of preference to a person of conviction. And God, I'm going to draw a line in the sand and say, I, I'm not going there. I'm not crossing that line no matter what. Are you ready to draw a line in the sand today? Let's pray.